Okay, welcome to week three. Um, so there's a number of topics that we'll be covering this week. Um, the labs that you guys are going to be doing uh, focus on ethnoarchaeology, experimental archaeology, which we'll talk a little bit about, as well as taphonomy, which we mentioned last week. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about this week was sort of the big picture questions archaeologists try to answer. Um, archaeology is not just focused on cultural history anymore like we saw in the first week when we were talking about the history of archaeology. Archaeologists now want to try to answer large research questions. Many of these questions relate to really three main topics. The evolution of, of humans, the origins of agriculture and settled life, and the beginnings or the origins of civilizations or state societies. Right? So essentially, how did humans evolve physically? Uh, how and why did we develop agriculture and move from hunting and gathering to agriculture? And how did we go from living in small-scale groups of 25 to 30 people to living in large groups of you know hundreds of thousands or millions of people? Uh, these are really the three big questions. You, could, you have smaller research questions which are affiliated or associated with these larger questions. So, for example, uh, let's say you were interested in the ancient Maya and uh, you wanted to uh, research more how the Maya went from small groups to then large cities. You wanted to figure out what were the driving factors that made the Maya live in larger and larger groups. Um, that is related to the origins of civilization and states. Right? So we're not going to cover too much about human evolution in this class. We'll go a little bit uh, when we talk about stone tools, we'll talk a little bit about different stages of human evolution. But uh, we have an Anthropology 206 Human Origins class that really focuses in specifically on this question. This is really uh, the, the realm of paleoanthropologists. Okay, so what about agriculture? Well, uh, if you've taken the 215 class, Origins of Civilization, uh, we talk a lot about this question and the next question. Uh, so if this is something that interests you, you might think about taking that class. Um, but the origins of agriculture is sometimes called by archaeologists the Neolithic Revolution to kind of compare it to the Industrial Revolution. So there are big revolutions in human history that changed the way we live. One of them was farming. Because with hunting and gathering, this is something we'll talk about throughout the semester, um, people move around through the landscape and they collect wild foods that grow naturally and they hunt wild animals. Right? Everything is sort of appearing on its own. With agriculture, you're typically using domesticated plants and domesticated animals and you are producing food. You're actually growing your own food. You can uh, generate more food than you necessarily need or that would grow naturally on the landscape. Now this had a big impact on human history, right? Why? Well, there's a couple of advantages to agriculture, but there's also disadvantages. Right? The big advantage is that it can be more productive. You can generate more food in an area than you could with hunting and gathering, right? Um, the, the benefit of hunting and gathering is that you're living sort of more in harmony with the environment. With agriculture, you're forcing the area to produce more food and you could end up overusing the land and its natural resources. Right? The um, other advantage of agriculture is that because you can produce more food, you can have more people. So populations can get bigger. Uh, also, some of those people, because there's more food than people, some of those people don't have to work in the fields like these folks over here and can actually specialize in crafts. They could make things. That's something else we'll explore uh, throughout the semester. The con and the advantage of hunting and gathering is that in general, 
uh, your health is better as a hunter and gatherer in terms of diet and physical labor than as an agricultural person, right? So the, the real main advantages are surplus food and larger populations and freeing up some people to do other things. Those people may not have a better diet. In fact, they'll probably have a worse diet. So the other interesting aspect about agriculture is that it appears in different parts of the world independently on its own at different times. Agriculture did not just appear once and then spread everywhere else. And a lot of the foods that we use, um, we kind of, um, you know, think maybe they're European. They're actually North American in ancestry. So corn, maize, we use a lot of that. Potatoes, that's all from uh, Central and South America, tomatoes, right? All these are what we call, quote unquote, new world crops. Wheat, barley, right? These were domesticated in uh, the Middle East. So a lot of archaeologists have been focusing on the question, how did agriculture take place in different parts of the world? What led up to agriculture? Why were people influenced to develop agriculture? Was it, as we talked about with using the scientific method the first week, is it because there were more and more people and they were forced to produce more food? Does it have something to do with the changing climate? Um, there's a lot of factors and a lot of different questions that people have asked. So one of the first people, as we said before, to do this kind of new archaeology in the Middle East or the Near East, as it's sometimes called, was Robert Braidwood and his wife, Linda. Um, and he was one of the first ones to generate a hypothesis and then go out and test his hypothesis. Uh, his hypothesis was that people developed agriculture over time because they were naturally curious and they naturally experimented with plants and animals and over time the technology improved until at a certain point they had produced domesticated plants and animals and uh, were able to generate more and more food from them. We'll talk about domestication in a few weeks. Right? And so he decided that, okay, if I want to test my hypothesis, how would I test it? Well, if I believe that people were living side by side with wild plants and wild animals and experimenting with them, I need to go to the area in the Middle East where these wild plants and wild animals exist. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. So rather than, let's say, go to an area um, where wild wheat never existed, he went to an area where there's still wild wheat and he found an early agricultural site. And based on the information available, he said that this supported his hypothesis. Obviously, it turned out to be more complicated as people start to dig more and, f and do more research and find more sites, right? But the fact that he found an early agricultural site where he suspected one would be, you know, sort of supported his idea. Okay, well, what about larger scale societies? Societies like... Um, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, right? Well, this really gets to the origins of complexity and the origins of inequality, right? So this is, you know, inequality is a topic that's very much uh, talked about today in today's society, right? Why are certain people unequal in terms of wealth and power? Uh, you know, how did we go from societies where there was more consensus building to societies where really a few core people have most of the wealth and power uh, and the majority of the people do not, right? So in terms of social inequality, you know, sometimes people bring up people like Jeff Bezos, who I think earns, I don't know how much a day, but it's in the millions. And um, three major billionaires in the United States own something like, I think it's 50% of the entire wealth of the United States, All right? We would say that is a, uh, extreme social stratification, difference between the top and the bottom. And we'd also say there's political centralization, um, powers held in the hands of a few people, All right? So how do we go from small scale farming villages to then really, really large um, cities? Well, this is another big question. This is one of the big picture questions that I was interested in in grad school. I wanted to learn about the beginnings of civilization in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and so archaeologists use anthropology 
to understand this. Anthropologists tend to divide groups uh, by how they're organized into really four categories, bands, tribes, chiefdoms, and states. This is going from smaller scale to larger scale, right? So increasing complexity. We'll talk about what complexity actually is over time. So in order to sort of understand this big picture question, we kind of have to look a little bit at bands, tribes, chiefdoms, and states. So many people know what hunting and gathering is. Um, you know, if you've learned about it in school, you've seen movies, uh, and we'll talk about hunting and gathering. Hunt hunters and gatherers are also called foragers. They're mobile people who go and collect wild plants and hunt wild animals, share food in groups of maybe 25 to 30 people. They don't live in year-round villages. They move. Um, the technology is fairly simple. Uh, they have to be able to carry things with them so they can't accumulate a lot of things. Um, no one person has absolute power over everybody else. Uh, there's a lot of consensus building and, and they try to come to an agreement in terms of uh, problems and things like that. Um, and this is the kind of society based on the archaeology we think that humans have lived in for like 90% for like of human history. As people settled down and started to, we could say garden, maybe not quite agriculture yet, but as they started to kind of intensively collect and intensively grow things, um, they kind of entered societies that we would call tribes. Right? There's still some tribes in the South Pacific and there's still some tribe groups in the Amazon. This is a, a tribal village in the Amazon. Now we're talking about groups of 100 to 200 people. You can accumulate things. You live in the village all year round. You go out, you hunt. Hunting is a small part of your diet. Most of the people here in this part of the Amazon among the Yanomamo tribe go out and they um, harvest plantains and they harvest other crops and that's a big part of their diet right here there is differences in wealth and power right not an extreme amount but there are noticeable differences so the way that tribe societies work they're sometimes characterized as big men societies right big men grow food and accumulate surplus and what they do with that surplus is they actually give it in these large feasts to other members of the tribe and in return they get prestige sometimes they get obligation like uh, people working for them they get loyalty from people so they can remain big men or leaders in the society but their status is not permanent they don't pass that status down to their children um, so it's not fixed permanent what we call classes Right? So there's still kind of relative little flux, but that's another sort of uh, group to understand. Uh, how would you tell hunting and gathering groups archaeologically? You f if you find a site, fairly small site, 25 to 30 people, people living at that site, you could tell based on archaeological evidence, and this is something that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks. You know from the archaeological evidence that people didn't live there all year round you're probably looking at a band society. If you've got villages that are all the same size, there's no difference between the size of the villages, but they're much bigger than hunter and gatherer villages, you know, like 100 people, 200 people. You know from the stuff you find that they're living there all year round. You probably have a tribe society. All right, what comes next? What comes next are what we call complex societies chiefdoms and then states chiefdoms and states are complex because the differences in wealth and power are permanent right? there is a fixed hierarchy uh, there's in some cases classes or castes um, but you're born into a certain group you typically live and die in that group right so things are more fixed in these complex societies um, and we're going to see that probably one of the best chiefdoms historically to, to uh, read about and learn about 
to help understand how ancient chiefdoms might have worked is actually the chiefdoms of Hawaii. When Europeans landed in Hawaii in the 1700s, um, as opposed to um, you know, Papua New Guinea over here, where people were living kind of in big men's societies and you know, tribe societies, Hawaii had kind of uh, developed into larger scale groups with more permanent leaders, really what we would call chiefdom societies. Right? So we will continue talking about chiefdoms in the next uh, video.